Hello, I'm Joan, director of the Southwest Spokane County Historical Society's Cheney Historical Museum. And today we're going to talk about why Cheney is here in this particular place. How did settlers come to be here? And how did Cheney become our name? First, there were people already here. This is part of the Spokane People's Territory. And they stocked the lakes with fish. They cultivated camas plants in the wetland and other plants and they managed the game in the area and had seasonal camps throughout the region. Now the Spokane people did have a winter camp near the spring at Cheney, um, approximately where Marketplace Restaurant is located today. That same building you may know as Gatto's. Earlier it was a yellow front store and it was actually built in 1959 as Cheney's very first supermarket, Gibson's Groceries. To the south, we have Stubblefield Plain, which was an important gathering spot. This was kind of the Native American fairgrounds, uh, where the Spokane people got together with their cousins, the Coeur d'Alene's, the Nez Perce, and others, and they would have uh, races and contests. There was vendors and lots of good fair food. Up here, a couple places that we will have in mind. Um, the Cook Homestead, this is uh, G.W., otherwise known as Silas Cook, his wife Marcella, and their daughter Mary. This is their homestead. And um, Mr. Wilbur Bassett, up here off of Granite Lake Road, he's the one who takes credit for naming Clear Lake, Silver Lake, and Granite Lake in our region. So now we've got the lay of the land. Let's go back in history. And in 1853, Washington Territory was created, signed by this fellow over here, Mr. Millard Fillmore. About that same time, or shortly after, the then Secretary of War, Jefferson Davis, sent out survey parties to explore four routes to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, in charge of the northern route was Isaac Stevens, who later became our first territorial governor. And amongst the party was another fellow who's famous in our area, John Mullen. Um, he, along with a number of army officers, engineers, naturalists, surgeons, astronomers, uh, geologists, artists, and draftsmen, uh, looked for a route that would bring them from the Midwest out to the Pacific Ocean. They actually split somewhere around Spokane Falls, um, or actually probably closer to the Tri-Cities, where one group then headed off to see if they could get to Seattle, and the other group went down to Portland. Then the Civil War comes in and interrupts things. However, during that period, the uh, Congress did charter the Northern Pacific Railway Company in the wartime. So things were prepared to start getting going again once the war ended. Now, after the Civil War in 1866, the route and the right of way were again surveyed, making sure that they had chosen the area that they wanted. And the Northern Pacific Railway was granted land by the government to sell in order to pay for the railroad's construction. In Washington, we come down out of Idaho, go by Spokane Bridge area, through Spokane Falls, by Cheney, uh, down through the town of Sprague, Ritzville, and then turn down there and go all the way down to Ainsworth uh, on the Columbia River. They also noted that there was a good spring coming up out of the ground at this spot at Cheney, and there was a year-round pool of water. Now this was very important because the location of Cheney is the highest point on the route between the foothills of Idaho and the Columbia River. This is one of the earliest references to this place as Big Springs as early as 1877 and 1878. Um, there were sections for the railroad to sell, and there were also homestead lands opening up that the government was selling in order to create a population out here to make the railroad work and to populate the land to keep those pesky Canadians away. A quick review of uh, homestead land and things. Um, the area was divided up from the Midwest out to the West into townships and ranges and then sections within that. A homestead could be granted by the government on the even numbered sections as you see here. 
um, all you needed to be was 21 years or older, and they changed the rules during the Civil War to say that you had not fought against the Union. Uh, the homestead could also be filed in your wife's name, which allowed families to pick up additional lands. Uh, the requirements were that you lived on the land for five years, improved it, and then you paid a small fee and the land was then yours. Now, if a man had served in the Union military during the Civil War, he could get time off uh, credited from his time served up to four years on that five-year time requirement. There was also some additional bonuses that might give um, a soldier additional access to land up to 160 acres. And there, here we have our second reference. Cheney is here in section 13. This is railroad land. Um, Cheney now spreads into, you know, 11, 12, 14, 23, and 24, but section 13 is another one of the names that we had in the beginning. We are, by the way, located in section 13 of Township 23 North and Range 41 East of the Willamette Meridian that is a place in Oregon where that everything is measured from. Now there was a lot of advertising going on, articles being written in the Midwest and Eastern newspapers to get people to come out here. Um, I'm quoting from one where it says, take the wagon road. If a person wants to save time and desires to bring with them stock, wagons, etc., the quickest and most direct route would be to come from Omaha to Ogden and thence by wagon road up to this new country. Traversing the distance from Ogden in two to three weeks when the roads are good, say in the months of June, July, or August. Now, if you don't have stock, you could take the train to Kelton and reach the upper country. Now, Kelton was at the time, it's now a ghost town, a very important railroad stop just to the north of the lake and um, outside of Ogden. So you went to Kelton and then you could take a stage line uh, up to Boise or on the wagon, same wagon and stage route up to Walla Walla. Those of you who have neither wagons nor teams can come by rail to Kelton at a cost of about $50 in the emigrant car and thence by stage to Walla Walla at an expense of $75 excluding your meals and therefore on to by stage to Colfax or Spokane Falls, costing you $7 or $10 respectively. Now supplies in those very early days came mainly from Walla Walla, which had the fort and a port on the river. Sugar, flour, and many other staples came in big barrels. Um, and while I don't have the equivalents in today's prices, flour and sugar was about $3 a barrel. You could also buy, of course, fabric, thread, notions, and other kinds of goods, nails, and things for building and things for agriculture, uh, also at Walla Walla. This fellow that you see here, Mr. Isaac Ballinger, who was later one of the early mayors of Cheney, this is how he made his early living, hauling freight from the port of Walla Walla up to the Four Lakes country in the 1870s. Mr. Ballinger working the freight lines uh, from Walla Walla up to this area and to Spokane Falls used a four mule team and a very heavy wagon it took him four days to get down to Walla Walla, and on the return trip with his wagon full, it would occupy a full six days during average weather. His team could haul 4,000 pounds a load, and besides the cost of goods, he charged his customers two cents a pound for the freighting. Now I want to introduce you to Marcella and Mary Cook. Marcella is the wife of G.W. Cook, and Marcella is her younger daughter. Now, the year before, in 1877, her husband, G.W., um, along with a number of other uh, immigrants, headed out this way to take state claim to their land, along with Mary's, or Marcella's, excuse me, elder daughter, Jane, and her husband, Sam Showalter. So over the course of the year from 1877 onward, Marcella spends her time 
you know, working on gathering supplies, selling off stock and land and goods and household items in order to pay for their journey west and set themselves up in their new homestead. Now, Mary uh, wrote that on July 10th, 1878, Mother and I bade our loved ones goodbye and set out on our long journey. It didn't actually leave on the 10th. The next day on July 11th, they're packing their trunks in their dinner baskets and doing the last bit of packing up. And it's not until the 15th of July that they started out in the evening with their hired man, Ed, driving them from Avoca, Nebraska up to Omaha. And they arrive in Omaha on the morning of the 16th, ready to get on the train. Now, Mary says, we rode on an emigrant car attached to a freight train. The emigrant class was the least expensive fare. The car was very plain, had wooden seats or benches. This one seems to actually have two layers. Some of them had an upper berth and others did not. Each passenger could bring on board into the car one bag. All of their other trunks and bags and things had to be checked into the luggage car at an additional cost. We can all relate to that with airlines today. At one end of the car, there were two toilet rooms, one for men and one for women. At the other end of the car, there was a stove with a supply of wood provided by the railroad. And that stove was used both for cooking and for heating the car. There was also a bucket of water for the car. And that water was used for everything that you needed water for. Um, I can imagine to some degree, as Mary and Marcella were traveling in the summer, that having that stove running was probably pretty hot. And if you opened the windows in the car, you would be getting a face full of coal dust and soot. Now, you could do cooking on the stove, or if you didn't bring your own food, you could scramble off the train during the three daily meal stops and buy a 25 cent meal at the station restaurant. Passengers could also rent a straw mattress from the conductor which was then placed either on the bench or on the floor between the seats. And I'm guessing that those straw mattresses were rarely, if ever, cleaned between passengers. Now back to our advertisement to the folks back east. The train route via San Francisco, thence to Portland by ocean steamer, and thence to Almoda on the Snake River by boat. A fare to Portland will cost two to thirty dollars according to the cabin occupied and the state of opposition on the route. To Almoda, it's an additional eighteen dollars exclusive of any meals and whether you have a berth in the boat. So if you want to sit on the deck, it'll be eighteen bucks. The Overland Railroad Company makes a little difference in price through its tickets to getting off at Kelton by Ogden or going to San Francisco. And at the present time, the route via San Francisco and Portland is undoubtedly the easiest and cheapest provided you are not bringing your team with you. Now, Mary and Marcella got off the train in Sacramento on the 24th of July to have dinner at the Western Hotel. Then they reboarded the train and the train arrived at San Francisco on the 25th. Now immediately, Marcella ran off to the ticket office for the boat to buy a ticket to go to Portland, but the boat leaving the next day on the 26th was full. So they had to wait in San Francisco until the 31st of July to take the steamship Oregon, it's a picture of that. Um, and Marcella notes that I am in room 23, berth number three. I am sick all day and I go to bed before the boat even starts out. The route of the steamship more or less hugs the coast and it takes four days to get to Portland and they arrived on the 3rd of August at just after daylight where they were met by her daughter Jane and husband Sam Showalter at the wharf. They then spend the next 12 days in Portland getting ready to make the trip buying additional goods, those things that you can only buy in a large city. So Marcella noted in her journal that it was the 14th of August when they started on the riverboat for Walla Walla. 
she gave Sam, her son-in-law, $11.25 to pay for the freight they were bringing with them. Now back to the advertisement from the newspapers. It tells us that immigrants from Oregon and California traveling in the earlier part of the season, when they have some money to spare, often come by water to the Dalles or to Almoda and thence go by team overland to their final destination. Those who are traveling without teams are recommended to come by boat to Penawawa or Almoda and there they can take a stage for the upper country via Colfax. And some people just make the trip overland from Oregon or California. It tells us that Puget Sounders can come by way of Portland and Almoda unless they want a delightful horseback ride over the Cascade Mountains at midsummer. The, Snoqu the Snoqualmie route is the one that is best for horsemen, leading the traveler by way of the Kittitas Valley, Yakima City, and Ainsworth. Now be sure that your saddle horse is gentle, sure-footed, and strong, and in splendid condition for traveling. It's not an easy route. Accommodations on the Columbia River boats are excellent, and every attention is paid to the comfort and convenience of the passengers. No one who has an opportunity to do so should fail to take a trip either up or down the Columbia River, where the scenery is magnificent and beautiful in the extreme. So as noted by uh, Mary, she said that they were carried around the rapids and the boat was hauled past those. And Marcellus notes that when they arrive at, they went to Wallula and then took a narrow gauge uh, railroad over to Walla Walla. Marcella's instructions were to go to the St. Louis house, which was a hotel at Walla Walla when they arrived. At points, we had to be carried around the rapids, and then we took that narrow gauge railroad. They then spent 14 days at Walla Walla, arriving on the 16th of August. And during that time, uh, Marcella notes in her journals that she ends up, now whether it's at the St. Louis House Hotel or elsewhere, that she's doing laundry not only for herself, but for the fellow that uh, owns the place. And she's also making, uh, going through the list and stocking up on the final set of supplies that her husband has sent a uh, request for. And now the last leg of their journey. Marcella notes in her journal that on August 30th, Mr. August, who was a man by the name of Covert August or August Covert, depending on which document you look at, he came with a wagon to bring them home with all their supplies. They started out on the 1st of September and camped at Waitsburg. Then they kept heading, heading north and on the 2nd she notes that there was a terrible wind and dust storm all day and they camped at the two canyons. On the 3rd they camped at Camp Cook. On the 4th they made it to Palouse Bridge. On the 5th, they were at a place called Camp Enders. And on the 6th of September, she notes that we got home at about two o'clock in the afternoon. And Mary says, we arrived at our cabin home to meet my father. Now, Mary and Marcella's journey had started, as we recall, back on the 15th of July, and it ends on the September the 6th in 1878. The entire journey took them 53 days, including their stopovers. Now we'll go through the names. As we noted earlier, the names Big Springs and Section 13s are ones that we find in 1877 and in early 1878. In 1878, two Cronks, and this is named for George and Hannah Crunk, with a U, um, who were early settlers and may have been part of that group that was with Mr. Cook that came out the year before. Um, I'm wondering about the pronunciation because while George and Hannah, all the documents that they're on, it is spelled with a U, on all of the newspaper articles, it's spelled with an O. So somehow, Kronks is pronounced in a way that you would mistake it with an O. 79. 
and into the early part of 1880, the name Willow Springs takes over from the willows down by the springs. And there are still, in fact, willow trees there that you can go and look at if you travel down on Front Street. Spring of 1880, you have the name Depot Spring catching on. And this is a name you see when the railroad workers are grading the track bed into May and June. very brief time, the citizens of Chinis in the summer of 1880 seem to have chosen the name Billings, naming it for the president of the Northern Pacific Railroad. But there already was one in Montana, so this didn't last. Finally, in the Spokane Times of September 11, 1880, General John W. Sprague, the Northern Pacific Railroad superintendent for the district, declared, note, name change. The town recently laid out at Depot Springs had its name changed from Billings to Cheney. The Honorable Benjamin P. Cheney is one of the directors of the Northern Pacific Railroad, and Frederick Billings is its president. Cheney is one of five towns recently located on the line of the Northern Pacific Railroad between Ainsworth and Spokane Falls. This article is picked up in the Palouse Gazette and Walla Walla Statements shortly after that. So here's how we became Cheney. By the fall of 1880, we now permanently have our name of Cheney. We are vying for the Spokane County seat. We are looking to get a school built on the town site. We have more people moving in and the railroad line has been tracked, has been graded. The railroad itself will come through the following year and we are ready to take off and be the best town we can be. If you have any questions, go ahead and put some in the, in the comments and we'll see about that. If you have any ideas or questions of other historical things that go on in Cheney, please put it in the comments. I appreciate you coming and we'll see you next time.